Rosie Abbey Baptist Church. It is so good to have you back this evening as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Let's stand. Let's open our service to sing that chorus. Nothing is easy. excited about what you have for us tonight. Now I just pray, Lord, that even now you'd be preparing our hearts and, Lord, that we would leave here knowing we have met with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements here tonight. Um, remember this Friday, uh, Faith Baptist of Robert 9 will have the Morels there uh, doing a concert. And so if you'd like to go over and hear some good Christian music, that would be a good opportunity for you. On uh, uh, this Friday night at seven o'clock. Also, remember for our Christian school parent orientation night is also on August the twenty fifth. And so, uh, if you have children in the Christian school, be mindful of that. Uh, that we need to come over and get your books and get everything all set up uh, for the school year starting on the August the twenty eighth. So it will not be tomorrow, but next Monday will be the first day of school. Uh, the other thing is we're going to be doing a walk for life uh, in November. It's on November the 4th. We have not done anything like that before. And uh, so we're going to be organizing and planning, putting that together. If you'd like to help out in the leadership realm of uh, just meeting together with us and fulfilling some responsibilities so that event will run smoothly, be sure to uh, let Pam Zollner know or you can give a call over to the church office and let Beth know. Uh, September, we'll be having some meetings together to organize and structure that and get ready to be able to raise some funds for the Open Door Pregnancy Center. And remember this Wednesday, our youth group's going down to uh, the beach and they'll be leaving here at the church at four o'clock. If you have any questions about that, be sure to see uh, Pastor Petrozello. Uh, remodel on our sanctuary is coming up. We're still planning on um, on uh, Monday the 18th 
the interior decorators are going to supposedly be here. I've been in communication with them. They said that bait is still good. And so the week before that, we're going to be doing some painting in here. Uh, on course on that Saturday, uh, September the 9th, uh, we're going to be painting all the walls. And so if you signed up to help out with doing that, make sure that you're here, 8 o'clock in the morning, and we'll be ready to go. Uh, besides that, before that Saturday, I'd like to have a few guys, if you can, help us go ahead and put primer on the walls. So when everybody gets here on Saturday, uh, we can just let them rip with the paint, amen, and we'll be done. <laughs> and so uh, you be praying about all this stuff that's coming up, and I know God will bless us and use us in a great way. Well, Pastor Duong is going to come. We're going to sing a couple more songs. 656, send the light. You'll get a great message to tell this world, and it's the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand 656, send the light.
County, New Jersey, or wherever you call us from, may we be willing and available, and Lord, just be willing to know that wherever we go, the Spirit of God goes with us, you guide us, direct us, and empower us. And Lord, we just pray now that you would use this offering for your glory, and Lord, that it would just further the gospel message here and around the world. Bless the gift and giver alike in Jesus' name we pray. Mexico, and so brother, why don't you come on up and introduce yourself to your family, and God bless you for coming and, and being willing to share what God's doing in Mexico. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm Pastor Robert Wilson from Guadalajara, Mexico, and uh, we've been in Mexico now for 20 years. Uh, for two years, we're starting out, we're with a veteran missionary in Monterey. And then we started our church 18 years ago, our first church in Guadalajara, Mexico. And uh, we have four churches going now. I pastor two churches. And then um, two of our men have gone up to start other churches there in Guadalajara. Uh, just to give you an idea what Guadalajara is like, just imagine um, a city smaller than New York, but that layout, you know, buildings all connected, uh, no alleys behind the houses, all the buildings connected on the block. And uh, we look like sardines, uh, five million people. Five million people, but 100% Mexicans. And it's just all uh, Mexican people, except our family. <laughs> but um, uh, we're there in Mexico, and I've um, been serving uh, as a pastor, and my, my family's going to come and sing a song for you all tonight, so my family will come up, and we'll introduce ourselves up here so you can know us all. And uh, just make sure, uh, before you get one of our prayer cards, we'd like you to remember us and pray for us. So we have prayer cards. If you didn't get one yet, on the way out, uh, we'll give you a, a prayer card. This is my family. My son Robert, uh, we're leaving him in a week and a half uh, here for Bible college. He's going to be going to Bible college, my son. So this is our last trip with my son, um, Robert. There he is. <laughs> Robert. So we're going to introduce ourselves. I'm Robert. I'm Annie. I'm Robert Jack. I'm Veronica. I'm Rosalinda. And we're the Wilson family. <laughs> Who 
showing our church when we first started it, when we were renting our first building, uh, then it shows the building that we bought, that we have remodeled completely, it was just uh, just a husk, just a shell, and uh, with God's grace we were able to transform it into a, a beautiful building with a lot of work, uh, then it shows um, our men that have gone out and started two more churches in our city, and then at the end it shows the church, the other church we started, we had a family in our church donate us a building, wow. uh, just give us the, the deed and the keys, and said here you go. So I prayed about it. What are we going to do with this other building? And the Lord impressed me to start another church. So um, I passed to one church with pretty normal services, 10 o'clock Sunday school, uh, 12, um, 10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock preaching service. And then we take a group to the other church at 3 o'clock and have our service there. And then we come back to our first church for the evening services. So all that's in the video. And, of course, any questions you might have at the end, if you want to stay and ask me something, that'd be fine. But I think uh, we'll go ahead and show the video now, then I'll, I'll deliver a message for you all. Thank you. Hi, we're the Wilson family. We are missionaries serving in Guadalajara, Mexico. In 2005, we started the Mount of Calvary Baptist Church on the east side of Guadalajara. We started out in a rented facility where we saw many saved and baptized and were able to establish a core group of people. In 2010, the Lord led us to buy a building just two blocks away from our rented facility. It was then just a shell with only a partial tin roof that did not even cover the whole property. The walls were bare bricks. 
It did not look like much. However, we did not see this building for what it was, but for what it could be. We replaced the tin roof with a concrete roof that covered the whole property. We also plastered the ceiling and the walls. We added pillars and arches to make it more appealing, and we also put in a new breakfast street with changing rooms on each side. We then installed ceiling fans and painted, and this is how our building looks now. To God be the glory for the great things He hath done. We have labored much to make our church as warm and inviting as possible. Psalm 96.6 says, Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. In 2019, we built our children's auditorium on the roof of our church, expanding our facilities 30%. Jesus said, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Many children have grown up in our ministry and are now helping our church as adults and teenagers. Another exciting ministry is our rehab ministry. Our men accompany me to different rehabilitation centers to preach to men who are struggling with addictions such as drugs and alcohol. Our goal is to help them become prosperous Christians, future church members, and maybe even one day work in the ministry. Speaking here is Juan Garcia, one of our church members, giving his testimony about his past life of drug addiction, jail time, and drunkenness, and how Jesus delivered him. The men in the facility help us fill the tank so that we can baptize them right there in the rehab. Here you can see this long line of men awaiting baptism. Amen. I have had the privilege of baptizing as many as 53 men in just one service in a rehab. We hold many open air services in Guadalajara. We preach in lots, plazas, parks, and soccer fields. In our largest meeting pictured here, there were more than 400 people present. Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said unto his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. One of the ministries closest to my heart are the church routes. I am a bus kid and was reached to the bus ministry when I was five years old. One of our greatest needs is church vehicles, since we are consistently branching out to new areas, and many times we double run our vehicles. We also get many new prospects from our open air meetings. We pray for more laborers, as the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I would like to present some of the fruit of our ministry. These young people are the result of much hard work. We are preparing them for full-time Christian service by working in our ministries. I led Arturo Zabaletti's family to Christ in their living room. His family rapidly grew in grace. They all became Sunday school teachers in our church, with Arturo graduated from a local Bible college. He has now started another church on the other side of our city. Ms. Ayel Mesa was our church song leader and an adult Sunday school teacher. He has now taken a pastorate in Tuxpan, Veracruz, Mexico. His new pastorate is thriving. I invited Jonathan and Avalos to church for several months before he finally came. He was there saved and called to preach under my ministry. Brother Jonathan has started a church about half an hour away from us. The day we visited, there were over 80 people present. Brother Jonathan does not have a church building, so the adults meet out on the street. The children meet in the living room of one of his converts. Please pray for these men for wisdom for their ministries. We started a new church here in our city. One of our church families donated a building to us half an hour away from our current facility. We held our grand opening service on January the 6th, 2019. To the glory of God, 60 brand new people came from the area to attend our first service. I am now pastoring two churches, Mount Calvary Baptist Church and Mount Zion Baptist Church. 
We are holding services at our new church at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so as not to interfere with the morning or evening services of our other church. This new church is only two blocks from a major thoroughfare that runs through our city, putting many new neighborhoods within our reach. sitting on his throne, anticipating another sinner, will soon become his own. Years of wasted living, and years of toil and strife, are just about to be over, as he receives the gift of Lamentations chapter 1, Lamentations chapter 1, and once again, uh, Pastor, what a privilege it is to be here behind the pulpit. I know it's not a light thing for a pastor to give his pulpit over, and I consider it a great privilege uh, to be able to speak to you tonight, and it's a blessing to be here in the church, and uh, what, a, what a wonderful uh, place to be. Okay, Lamentations chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 12 through 16. Lamentations 1, 12 through 16. Lamentations 1, verses 12 through 16. And y'all are comfortable to stay there in your, your place, and I'll just read everything out loud and just follow along in your Bible as I read. Lamentations 1, 12 through 16. I'll just read it for you tonight. Verse 12, Lamentations 1, 12. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow which is done unto me. Wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. From above hath he sent fire into my bones, and it prevailed against them. He hath spread a net for my feet, he hath turned me back, 
He has made me desolate and faint all the day. The oak of my transgressions is bound by his hand. They are reed and come up upon my neck. He has made my strength to fall. The Lord hath delivered me into their hands, from whom I am not able to rise up. The Lord hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a winepress. Verse 16 is the text. For these things I weep. Mine eye, mine eye, runneth down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate, because the enemy prevailed. My children are desolate, because the enemy prevailed. I want to speak to you tonight on the cry of the mission field. The cry of the mission field. And let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, here we are in your presence, thankful to be in your house with your people, free from the temptations and the filthiness of this world, a place where we can learn the Word of God, where we can be inspired. But Lord, we do not expect inspiration from mere human words, but from your Word that we have here in our hands. So Jesus, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. Holy Spirit, that you would take control of the, of the sermon, of the message, of my voice, and that you would speak to your people through me. I just present myself as an instrument, as a voice to be used. And any person tonight that is blessed, that is uplifted spiritually, Jesus, you will receive all the glory and all the honor. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. What we have here in Lamentations chapter 1 is the personification of the city of Jerusalem. The personification of the city of Jerusalem. Here Jeremiah is being a master of symbolism, comparing the city to one person, to a woman has been, who has been abused, battered, left in the street to die. And what Jeremiah is saying, who would not help a woman like that? Imagine if you were walking down the street and you heard a faint voice from an alley, help, help, help me. And you turn aside and see a woman there that's bloody and dying. Who, who here would not help her? Maybe you throw your coat over her if she was cold or shivering. Uh, you call the police or call an ambulance. You'd help her out. And I believe what Jeremiah is telling us here, just like we'd be willing to help just one person in need, why would we want to help an entire city in need? An entire city in need. It's kind of like Jonah and the gourd. How Jonah mourned over the gourd that died, and God said, Jonah, you mourned over a gourd. What about an entire city? And what God's saying here, he's saying, of course we rush to help one person in need, one person suffering, but a whole city in need, we should also help. I believe it could also be a cry for help from, from Jeremiah. Because it says in verse 12, is it nothing to you? I'll either pass by. As you know, pastors and missionaries will need help, help to reach the city. But here we have a beautiful story of Jerusalem who has been trodden down and defeated and in need of help. And Jeremiah responding to the cry. Jeremiah responded to the cry of the city, the cry that came from God. So what happened to the comforter? It says here in verse 16, For these things I weep, mine eye, mine eye, runneth down with water, because the comforter that should leave my soul is far from me. The cry of the mission field, the cry of the world, crying out for somebody to help them, for somebody to meet their needs. We have here in the Baptist church what the world is looking for. We have what they need. We have the gospel. We have Jesus Christ. We have to answer the call. We have to answer the call. The Lord hears the cries of a lost and dying world. And God calls people in His mercy, and His love, and His compassion. He calls people to answer the cry. I'll give you an example. God heard the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah. Imagine that city, that wicked city, how they suffered and how they cried out. God heard the cries. I want you to follow me to Genesis chapter 18. God heard the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 18. I believe here we have a tragic story. It, it, it appears that God wanted to save the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and the neighboring, neighboring city of Gomorrah. God didn't want to destroy them. But nobody did anything, so he had to destroy them. Genesis 18. 
And follow me here, verse 20 and 21. Genesis 18, 20 and 21. Verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the crime of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. You know how you read the same passage in the Bible various times and something jumps out of you that you didn't see before? Well, reading this one day, I read that part, and it says here, I will go down now and see whether they have done according to the cry of it. And ask myself, who, who is they? Who was supposed to do something? Who could have saved the city? Who was responsible? It says, I will see whether they have done according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. Maybe it was Lot. The Bible says in the New Testament that Lot was just. I believe it's talking about his salvation, that Lot was a saved person. It says in 2 Peter, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. The conversation is their lifestyle. Vex is that he was bothered with the filthy lifestyle of the people in the city. And then it says, For the righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The problem is that Lot was bothered, but he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. Imagine the Christ of the city and God heard the cry, and God said, I'm going to go down and see if they did something about it. If they did something about it. Lot, did you do anything? Apparently no. Uh, let's go on ahead. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 19, verse 12. When the angels came to the city, they asked Lot if he had, if he had any people with him that, that he needed to take out. Verse 12, 19, 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whosoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. And I said there, sons and daughters. We know that Lot had four daughters, two that were single and two that were married. But here it says, Thy sons and thy daughters, thy sons. Now there might be a little conflict here, some saying yes or no, but I believe he had sons also. Maybe they were just so, so far... Um, uh, so far destroyed that they didn't have any hope. But Lot's family would have been then ten people. Lot, his wife, his four daughters, his sons-in-law, and his sons, two sons, would have been ten people. Lot could have saved the city. In the, in the last chapter, bargaining with God, Abraham got down to ten people. Yep. Ten people started with 15, then 45, then 30, then 20, then ten people. God said, okay, with ten people, I won't destroy the city. Lot, you're vexed with the filthy conversation. But Lot, what are you going to do? Are you going to try to save the city? Maybe Lot, and we know Lot went with ulterior motives to the city. He went for the bright lights and for the sin. Like, uh, maybe his wife was attracted to that, and that's why he went there. But Lot, you should have done something. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, For if the mighty works which had been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Jesus weeping, who should have done the mighty works? Who could have saved the city? Maybe Lot was the Jonah for Sodom, but he didn't do anything. God heard the cries, it says it, the cries of the city came up to heaven, and God said, I'm going to see what they have done. I'm going to see if they did something about it. Apparently, Lot did nothing. Lot joined in. Lot joined in with the, with the sin of the city. Brother, we have to do is do our part to save a lost and dying world. Maybe God is speaking to you to go, then answer the call. Maybe here in our area, God's calling you. Answer the call. Lot did nothing. God hears the cries of a lost and dying world. Crying out for somebody, like the city of Jerusalem, crying out. Jeremiah said, I'll compare the city to a woman that's battered and beaten and hurting. Who would not help her? How much more an entire city full of people crying out for help? How many cities around the world, just like Jerusalem was then, crying out for somebody? How many mission fields, how many places crying out for someone to help them? The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 12, speaking of the Philistines, it says, The men that died not were smitten with the emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. 
The cry of the city went up to heaven. Now the Philistines were crying out in pain, crying out in suffering, and the Bible says God heard them. God heard the pagans, and God gave them relief. God gave them wisdom on how to, how to be delivered from their suffering. God hears the cries of a lost and dying world. And God calls men and women to answer the cry. I already mentioned Nineveh. God heard the cries of Nineveh. And God sent, God sent Jonah to save the city of Nineveh. An interesting thing, the Bible says that Jonah went down to, went down to Joppa to get on a ship going to Tarshish. Now, many believe that Tarshish was, was Spain. Now, of course, if you're past this, otherwise, believe your pastor. But, uh, but some people believe it was Spain. But they say in the Old Testament, Tarshish was the end of the world. It was as far as you in the world. So it appears that, that Jonah, to run from God, wanted to go to the end of the world. Now, I believe that Jonah was one of many prophets that God called to the heathen in the Old Testament. We have the story of Jonah and what it, what it took for God to get him to Nineveh finally about the whale and him being cast into the sea, and how much effort it took for God to get Jonah find the Nineveh. I wonder if Tarshish was full of renegade missionaries. If Tarshish was full of men, Hebrews that God had called, that did not answer. God hears the calls of a lost and dying world. Who will answer the call? Who will send somebody to answer the call of the world? God hears the cries of the children. God hears the cries of the children. Let's go to Exodus 22. I'd like, to, I'd like you to see this. God hears the, the cries of the children. Children suffer. Many times they suffer and they're innocent. You know, the parents make bad decisions and the children are raised and the family suffering for the mistakes of the fathers. They're innocent. Who will hear the cry? Who will answer the cries of the children? It's a glorious thing. The Christian school here. Wonderful. God hears the cries of the children. How the children now they suffer. How the children need help today. Exodus 22, 21. Exodus 22, 21. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any, way, any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. I will surely hear their cry. Little children suffer too. The Bible says if you afflict them in any wise, and they cry unto me, I will surely hear their cry. How many children crying out for a comforter? How many children around the world? Maybe God's calling you. Or here in the end, God calling you to hear the cries of the children. Hear the cries of the children. Let's go to another passage, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. God hears the children. As I mentioned many times, the children suffer for the, the mistakes of the parents. The parents make mistakes and the children suffer innocently. The parents make wrong decisions. Isaiah chapter 54. Here it talks about an adult, a parent that's suffering. But how the kids can be saved, the kids can have a life of comfort, the kids can have a life of freedom. Here it talks of the parents in bondage, but the children raised in the Lord. Isaiah 54 verse 11. Isaiah 54 11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Here we have an adult, a parent, suffering, tempest, their life in ruins. You know how it is how in the church we have new families come, and praise the Lord, new, new families coming in. And many times they bring to us the pieces of their broken life. And as pastors, as workers, we take the pieces and put them together and bind them together. And make them, help God make them a useful vessel again. But the children are a blank slate. The children are innocent. The children are just a blank slate that we can write on. So it says here, afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and thy foundations with sapphires. Verse 12. And I'll make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. Verse 13, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. And great shall be the peace of thy children. I grew up in, in South Chicago. My mom had a lot of problems. My mom uh, wasn't in church. My mom didn't know what to do. My mom looking for relief in the wrong, wrong places. And then... Um, 
I was just a little child. My mom and into sin and, and all different things. And one day some people came and invited our family to church. Invited our family to church. My mom wasn't comfortable going with them to church, like maybe half an hour away. And my mom said, well, I, I don't want to go, but I had, I had a teenage sister. My, I was just a child, five years old. My sister, a, a teenager. And my mom said, you can take my daughter. Take my daughter to church. Take her with you. So I took my sister to church. My sister went, and my sister started changing. My sister started changing. She stopped smoking, stopped some of the stuff she was doing. My sister started um, soul winning. And my mom said, you know, that, that's something real. Well, the Baptist church is something real. So my mom decided, I'll take my son. So one day, they came to pick up my sister, and my mom took me to church with her. I went to church. Amen. Went to church when I was five years old, heard the gospel, was saved. Amen. I gave a testimony. I've never smoked, used drugs, drank alcohol, uh, any of that stuff in my life. Right. My mom does not have that testimony. My mom does not have my, that testimony. My mom tossed with tempest and I comforted, but I was taught in the Lord. My peace was great. What I'm saying, God hears the children. God hears the children crying out for somebody to help them. Who will hear the cry of the children? The cries of the children. Lamentations 3. You don't have to go there. I'll, I'll read it. My eye went down with rivers of water for the destruction of the God of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission, till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. Till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. God hears the children. God hears the children. Number two, God hears the teens. God hears the teens. And God calls somebody to answer the cry. God calls somebody to answer the cry. What well, Jeremiah said, we helped just one person. Who will not help a city in yeah. need? God hears the children. God hears the teens. Let's go to Jeremiah. I mean, Genesis 21. Genesis chapter 21. God hears the teens. Here we have the story of Ishmael and his mother Hagar. Ishmael and Hagar. Someone casually reading the story might think that Ishmael here is a, a child or a little, a little kid or a baby. But the fact is, in this passage, Ishmael is a teenager. He's a teenager. Genesis chapter 21. There at the beginning of your Bible, Genesis 21, verse 15. Genesis 21, 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. Bear in mind, he, he's a teen here, he's a teenager. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were, a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up, lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What is the Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. God heard the voice of the lad. God heard the voice of the teenager. And God called the Hagar out of heaven. When I was 17 years old, one night I was in my room, my bedroom, having my personal devotions. And God spoke to my heart. And God told me to be a missionary to Mexico. There are my devotions. There was no missions emphasis in the church. There was no um, push on going to Mexico, nothing like that. God just spoke to my heart to go to Mexico that night as a 17-year-old boy. And immediately I said, God, I'll go. God, I'll go. Referring to the passage, I wonder sometimes if it might not have been some teenage boy there in Mexico crying out that night. And God heard him and God Amen. called me. Just like here it says that God heard the lad and God called the Hagar out of heaven. I don't know that, but I do know this. God hears the teens crying out. And God wants someone to answer the cry of the teenagers. Who will answer the cry? Teenagers in need. Teenagers needing somebody to love them and care for them. Some direction. Some direction. I showed in our video, we have the, the we call it a rondaya. Several kids that play the, the guitar at the same time. They're in Mexico. Uh, we, had, we went to youth conference um, in June, took our teens to youth conference. But God hears the teenagers who hear the cry of the teens. God hears the children. God hears the teens all over the world. And God hears the adults. God hears the adults. Uh, follow me, if you will, to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. God hears the adults. Acts chapter 10. I showed in the video some of the men that have been saved 
our ministry that are now, now pastoring. Uh, we have two more young people leaving next week. Uh, Christian, one of the young men, he was, he was in the video, but Christian is going to Bible college, just like my son is going to Bible college here. We send our young people in Mexico to Bible college in Mexico. Be prepared to be in Mexico. Uh, Christian's going to Bible college. We have a young lady, Mayeli. Mayeli is leaving uh, next week also to go to Bible college. We have uh, so many young people already in Bible college. Uh, we have a, a young lady, Ruth. Uh, she's been in Bible college for two years. She just got married. And uh, their plan, her and her husband, when they finish, they come back to help us in the work. But who will hear the teens, the cries of the teens? God hears the teens, and God hears the adults. Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, let's start with verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian man, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Here we have a man that was spiritual, that was seeking God, but he didn't know where, he didn't know how. He was not saved. He was not saved. Verse 3. He saw the vision evidently about the ninth, ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him, and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. God heard the prayers of this man, unsaved man, sincere man, good man, looking for the truth. And God sent him Peter. God sent him Peter. What a beautiful story that he gathered his family and his friends for the coming of Peter. And Peter preached to them the gospel. God hears the cries. Children, adults, uh, teenagers all over the world. And God calls people to answer the cry. God calls people to answer the cry. Who will go or who will send somebody to answer the cry of the people all around the world? All around the world. And the video I showed a man named Jonathan. Jonathan who's now pastoring. When I first met Jonathan, I picked up his nieces for church. Jonathan has, well, they're, they're grown now, but there are two little girls I pick up. Siklali and Aksili, I pick them up for church in my van, on my route. And I pick up the two girls, and Jonathan would be there. He was a young adult. And I say, Jonathan, why don't you come to church with us? Jonathan, come us away. Come us to the iglesia. Come with us to church today, Jonathan. Jonathan, nah, nah, it's not, nah, it's not, nah, 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 I don't know, it's all right. Okay, well, okay, good, all right. Well, anyway, I pick up the two girls, and I keep picking up the route. And that, that went on for several months. I pick up the girls, Jonathan be out there, or sometimes he would, sometimes not. Jonathan, come with us, go to church. Nah, 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 no part of me, not for me. Okay, <laughs> so I kept up, and one day, I picked up the girls, Jonathan, come with us to church. He said, I'll go. I'll go this time. I'll go to church with you. All right, Jonathan. So, I, uh, Jonathan, he called me to church in his car. We got to church, and Jonathan received Christ as his Savior. Jonathan was saved. Jonathan was saved. Later, I was able to marry Jonathan, him and his wife. I was able to perform their wedding. Jonathan, his girlfriend, uh, when they were married, I led, the, I, I led their wedding. Jonathan got more involved in the church. We went to a Bible conference there in Guadalajara, a, a friend church. We went to a Bible conference. And the preacher preached that night. And afterwards, Jonathan came to me and said, Pastor, God's calling me. God wants me to be a preacher. So great, Jonathan, great. So Jonathan, you gotta get prepared. You need to go to Bible college. So he sent Jonathan and his wife to Bible college. Now Jonathan and his wife have graduated. Now they have their church going there in Guadalajara. They're probably about 30 minutes from us, their church. God hears the adults, teens, who will go? We went to the teen conference in Mexico City. We have our we take our teenagers to the conference. Imagine trying to bring them here, it'd just be too much trouble. But we take our teenagers to Mexico City to the conference. We took our team, we had a group. There was um, 36 people in our group counting the workers with the teenagers went to Mexico City. All the teenagers made decisions. They all made decisions. And God's working. God's working. We've heard the cry. We've answered. I'd like to finish with, a, with an illustration. An illustration. You might have heard how the church is compared to a spiritual hospital. Of course, a hospital ministers to our physical needs. But the church is a hospital for the soul. 
The church is a hospital for our spirit. So the church is like a, a, a spiritual hospital. Like, you know, we say that the church is not a museum where the relics unite the seers, the most polished, the most beautiful. No, the church is a hospital where we tend to people that are suffering with depression, with, um, uh, with, with um, being sad, people that have lost all hope. We administer to the, to, the, to, the, to the soul, to the spirit. And of course, we'd rather suffer physically than emotionally. But how many people come to the churches suffering emotionally, suffering with problems, and they come to church? And here in the church, we help them. We give them hope. We help guide them through their problems. We help guide them through their, their troubles. The church is a spiritual hospital. Well, using this metaphor, our church there in Mexico, our hospital, our hospital is severely overrun and understaffed. Our hospital is severely overrun and understaffed. I'm the only doctor there. I'm the only doctor trying to tend on all the people, trying to tend on all the people. You can imagine we have to leave. I announce to the people, I have to go. I have to go. And the patients say, doctor, don't leave us. Doctor, you, you can't go. You can't leave us here behind. What's going to happen to us? No, but I'm sorry. I have to, I have to raise more funds. Our, our funds are, are getting low. We've got to raise more funds. Don't leave us. I'll be back soon. I'll be back fast. Last month we went to California. Before we went to youth campus, we went to California. My family went to California uh, to try to raise support just for a week. We're in different churches in California, three different churches, trying to raise more support. And when I came back to Guadalajara, when I went back home, one of the ladies, shaking her head, she said, um, she said, Pastor, it's tu oficio aquí. Pastor, aquí es tu oficio. I'll translate, Pastor, this is your office. This is your place here. Your place is here, Pastor. We need you here with us. I said, I know, I know. Uh, I don't want to leave. I don't want to have to leave, but sometimes I have to go to, to get more support. The church is the hospital. The hospital understaffed. The hospital has needs. Uh, sometimes you have to replenish uh, replenish the goods of the uh, the goods of the spiritual hospital. People suffering tonight all over the world. People suffering in this area. People suffering, crying out for somebody to help them. Who will answer the call? Or who will send somebody to answer the call? Let's finish where we started off. Let's go back to Lamentations chapter 1. And we'll finish where we started up. Lamentations chapter 1. Such a, such a passage here. Verse 16. Lamentations 1.16. The weeping prophet Jeremiah calling for the city of Jerusalem, answering the cry of God to come to the city, just like many cities all around the world, crying out for somebody. Lamentations 1.16. For these things I weep, mine eye, mine eye, runneth down with water. Picture the city of Guadalajara there. Because the comfort that should leave my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. And we have to get back there before the country is desolate, before the, the enemy prevails, rescue the people from destruction, people suffering, crying out for someone to answer the call. Sometimes when we're there in the, the church, I'll be there in my church in Guadalajara, and we'll have an evangelist come in to speak, an evangelist or some, some special meeting, and I'll take advantage of the fact that someone else is behind the pulpit, and I'll say, I'm going to go to the children's church, I'll see what's going on with the, with the children. And so someone will be preaching behind my pulpit, and I'll go up in the Sunday school classrooms. And you know how the little kids are? The little kids just sing with all their might, how they love Jesus, and clap their hands, and sing about their love for God. And I'll say, we got to them at a good time. We got to these children at a good time. We, we rescued these children. These children are, are doing good. But then I'll have a mother come to me and say, uh, Brother Robert, my teenage son, my 16-year-old son, my 17-year-old son, He's into drugs, he's in with the narcos, he's in, uh, in problems, he's, he's dealing with stuff that he shouldn't, he's in the wrong crowd. Pastor, pray for my son. And I'll do it, I'll pray for him, I'll pray with her, I'll pray for her son. But I'll think, boy, it's just, it's just so late for him, I don't know what we can do. We have to reach them, but we still can. Let us pray. Every head bowed, every head closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for this old world. This old sin sick world getting worse. But how much more are the people crying out for somebody to help them? 
Somebody to relieve them. Somebody give them a little bit of relief when we're suffering. God, help us tonight to do what you have for us to do. As we continue to pray, I uh, just would ask you to ask the Lord and press upon your heart what it is that you can do. Uh, our brother was preaching. I was just thinking of just uh, in our area, around where we live, around this area in Tom's River, people are hurting. Uh, people are crying out. They don't even know what it is they need. And how desperately we need to reach out to them. But yet, there's also the cry across the sea. Uh, we need to be willing to surrender our life completely to the Lord. Just be willing to say, Lord, wherever you want to send me, I'll go. And uh, be ready to do that as God impresses on your heart. You might be here tonight. Maybe you're not sure you're saved. We'd love to pray for you. You slip your hand up if you say, I'm not sure if I died right now that I would go to heaven. And I need prayer about that. Anyone at all, just raise your hand up. No one's looking. Um, believers, let me ask you this. Are you, would you be willing to go if God would call you? And uh, I, I want to pray for you specifically about this willingness to go if God would call. And this is a serious response. Would you be willing to say by lifted, lifted hand, uh, I'd be willing to go if God would call me to go on the mission field. I want to pray for you. Will you slip your hand up? You say, I feel God impressed when I see that hand. Might be someone else. Just say, I'm willing to go. God bless you. You put that hand down. I'm willing to go if God would call. My Father, I come to you. I thank you so much uh, for tenderness and willingness, Lord, uh, tonight to to go, go wherever you want us to go, to do whatever it is you want us to do. Lord, I'm so thankful that, uh, God, the, your call upon us is so special uh, because of the fact it gives us the opportunity to reach those that are crying and are hurting. Uh, I pray for our church, Lord, as we uh, look at our community in which we live, Lord. Um, help us to hear the cries of those that are in need. And help us not just to hear the cry, but help us to do something about it. God, help us to reach out to others. Help us to continue to surrender our life anew and afresh each and every day. And I pray, oh God, I pray that Jesus Christ will be exalted and lifted up. I pray there will be precious souls that would be drawn to him. And so I pray you would bless in this invitation now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing, I Surrender All. And as we're singing, if the Lord's laid on your heart to pray tonight, why don't you come and pray? And just ask the Lord to show you what it is that you can do. And not just, I, I heard a statistic the other day. They said this, that over 10,000 people in New Jersey are homeless. And they said that so it's, it's the highest amount of people homeless in the history of New Jersey. And it said this. They said 25% of those that are homeless are under the age of 25. And I thought, my goodness gracious, how sad it is. And people are hurting. And we, we need to be willing just to speak up. We need to be willing just to reach out. We need to be willing not just walk past people. But we need to reach out and talk to them about Jesus Christ. I surrender all. Brother, why don't you come and leave? And as we're singing, you come and pray as God would impress upon your heart tonight.
unless you were being with us, Brother Wilson, why don't you uh, go out by in the foyer there so folks can say hi to you, and, and uh, we appreciate that message, and certainly ministry, music, and testimony, what God's doing. I always am touched when I see missionaries come, and they show us what God's doing uh, overseas. You know, I was thinking about that outside meeting they have. I leaned over to my wife. I said, can you imagine us doing that in Tom's River? <laughs> Just go out and start, hey, we're going to have a meeting out here and get about 400 people out in the park or something like that. My goodness gracious. Uh, we'd have a zoning board and everybody else coming in here and saying, you can't do that without a permit. And I see stuff like that. It touches my heart. I don't know what it does to you. It touches my heart. And it makes me realize that, wait a minute, uh, uh, I, I think there are greater ways that we can reach out and be a help and encouragement to people get the gospel it's the main thing, getting the gospel to people that they might be saved let's pray, Father thank you thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy uh, thank you for the Wilsons pray that you watch over them keep them safe, uh, help them to get back to Mexico very quickly and God provide for their needs and I pray for us that you continue to burden our heart and press upon us Lord how uh, we can reach out to others. And so bless now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. Amen.